Ukraine just tried invading Russia. Again. <coughs> I mean, special military operation. This time in the Belgorod region southeast of Kursk. After the way Russian soldiers just surrendered in Kursk, can you blame Ukrainians for trying more? The war in Ukraine is moving into a very different phase now. Both sides are upping the stakes. The latest is a new Ukrainian attack into Russia in the Belgorod region. But there have also been sizable Russian advances in Ukraine's east, with the potential to shake up the entire front in the Donbass. As you'll see, the cascade effect that was started with the Kursk invasion might be bigger than you think. Both sides are doubling down on their own offensives, at the cost of their defenses. Although this might seem surprising, it might be a sign that the war is coming to an end, as we'll go over later in the video. Zelensky is about to put forward a peace proposal, and he might try to use the Russian territories as a bargaining tool. So, let's dive into the latest developments on the front, and what this can mean for the future of the conflict. But before we start, I'd like to ask you for something first. If you guys drop a like down below, it helps us out a ton with the algorithm. This way, we can keep making videos like this. With that out of the way, let's get into the video. It's already been about a month since the Kursk attack began. Ukraine has been able to capture 500 square miles or 1,300 square kilometers of territory inside Russia. This includes 100 settlements, the largest of which is Sudsa. Most of the ground was captured in the early days, but after the initial weeks, the offensive slowed down. This has to do with an effect called the limit of exploitation. As Ukrainian troops expanded, their troops and resources were spread out over a wider area, making them less effective. Also, Ukraine's supply lines into Kursk reached their limit. This meant that the attack naturally slowed down. However, Ukraine has not stopped trying to conquer Russian areas. Recently, it's been intensifying its assaults on the Russian region neighboring Kursk, namely Belgorod. The Ukrainian government has said little about these attacks, similar to what it did in the first days of the Kursk invasion. Out of strategic and PR reasons, Zelensky didn't mention the incursion into Kursk until it was already halfway. Similarly, most of our information on the Belgorod nowadays comes from Russian and Ukrainian telegram channels, as well as the Russian government. The regional governor of Belgorod said on August 27th that Ukrainian forces are attempting to break through the border. Russian telegram channels are saying similar stuff although they're not the most trustworthy source. The MASH telegram channel said that two border crossings were attacked, one with 200 troops and another with 300 forces. Other channels have given different details but have acknowledged that an attack is unfolding. One claimed that the forces at the one border crossing were about the same in terms of personnel and numbers as in the first minutes of the Kursk incursion. Whether this includes tanks and armored vehicles is pure speculation, but it's entirely possible. At the same time, there have been reports of a huge shelling campaign by the Ukrainians in Belgorod, which forced schools to shut down. If even civilian targets are at risk, the military positions in Belgorod are in even bigger trouble. So there's definitely something going on in this Russian region. The Belgorod governor quickly said that the situation was under control, but we still have to take that with a grain of salt. The politicians in Kursk said the same on the first days of August, and that turned out to be false. There are no credible reports yet that the Ukrainians have broken through the lines in Belgorod, but it's very clear that it has a special interest in the area. If it's true that they're sending hundreds of troops to the border crossings, this will likely not be the last thing we hear about the Belgorod situation. Rather, it's a sign that Ukraine is starting a second operation inside Russian territory. We can only guess as to what the motivation might be for this. Perhaps Ukraine wants to conquer a second piece of land inside Russia as a buffer zone. This would make sense from a strategic perspective. Ukraine has done this before with Kursk, as its territory inside Russia protects the city of Sumy. In this sense, Belgorod is even more important. The two border crossings we talked about earlier have a ton of strategic value, 
as they're located right in between the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv and the Russian city of Belgorod. Kharkiv has been an epicenter of the conflict as Ukraine's second biggest city. There's been heavy fighting in and around the city in 2002, and years of shelling with drones and missiles afterwards. Just a few days ago, Russia attacked Kharkiv, wounding 55 and killing 6, including one child. Unfortunately, this is a regular occurrence in the city. In part, it happens so often because Kharkiv lies just 19 miles or 13 kilometers south of the Russian border. It's well within range of the highly destructive Russian glide bombs, launched by Russian aircraft dozens of miles from their targets. What made the problem even worse is that Russia captured parts of the Kharkiv region back in May of this year, bringing them even closer to the city. The territories it holds are right at the border crossings where fighting recently broke out. Russia has lost its momentum near Kursk in August, though. Before we jump into that, I'm sure you guys can tell today's geopolitical world moves very fast and it's pretty much impossible to keep up with all the news. And that's why we launched Global Recaps, a geopolitical newsletter that covers world news in a quick and simple way. Every day, we'll send out an email directly to your inbox that covers the most important world news that you can read in less than five minutes. Best of all, it's completely free, and you can sign up now by using the link in the description or scanning the QR code on screen. Let's get back to Russia. Russia has lost its momentum near Kursk in August, though. Even before the 27th, there had been a small-scale incursion into the region at the same time as the attack on Kursk unfolded. The 252nd Battalion posted a video in the village of Peroz in western Belgorod. It was more of a spillover from the Kursk incursion, as it was closer to Sumy than Kharkiv itself. But it had a huge effect. Not too long after, the region of Belgorod declared a state of emergency. The Russian Federal Security Bureau established a counterterrorism operational regime in the border regions to provide extra safety. The regional government began to evacuate people in border districts because of the imminent threat from Ukraine. For the Russians living in the area, these incursions are nothing new. There have been several border incursions into the regions led by the Russian legions fighting for Ukraine. A big one happened in May 2023. Another attack occurred on the 12th of March this year, where at least three groups entered the Belgorod and Kursk Oblasts. This included the Freedom of Russia Legion, the Russian Volunteer Corps, and the Sibir Battalion. It was initially seen as a form of protest during the 2024 Russian presidential election. These Russians fighting for Ukraine are against the war Putin started, and they want to see a change in leadership. Officially, Ukraine didn't support them, but that was probably a facade. We now know that Ukraine launched a similar offensive in August, but this time with a larger force and with actual Ukrainian soldiers. One theory is that the Russian legions gathered valuable intelligence on the border defenses in Kursk and Belgorod, which they passed down to Ukrainian command. In part, this explains why the Ukrainians were able to break the defensive lines in Kursk within a day and it could explain why it's attacking Belgorod now, although only time will tell how effective this campaign will be. Some military experts claim that the initial incursion was part of a much larger operation and that the Belgorod attack is an extension of the one in Kursk. Right now, Ukraine clearly has the momentum on the Russian border. Russia is still scrambling to put up defenses, as most of the Russians fighting in Kursk are conscripts, according to military analysts. By the way, this is a huge blow to Putin's reputation, as he promised that the conscripts would not be used for direct fighting on the front. Now, these young, inexperienced soldiers are getting killed and captured as prisoners of war. Anyways, if Russia's already struggling in Kursk, there may be a spillover effect into Belgorod. There are lots of reasons to think that this attack could be just as or even more potent than the one before. Ukrainian forces have destroyed critical infrastructure in Kursk, including several bridges over the Sem River. These bridges used to carry Russian supplies, so the destruction has downstream effects for the troops in Belgorod. If the lines are breached, Russia will have a seriously hard time to bring manpower, armor, and munitions to the area. 
While Ukraine doesn't have the crucial surprise element anymore, it still has the momentum here. What also helps is that Belgorod defenses aren't as strong as they used to be, because some military personnel and equipment has been redeployed to Kursk. The Russian Ministry of Defense reported that it had transferred a military column from Belgorod to Sudzansky district in Kursk. This included artillery pieces and combat support vehicles. Now, Russia has said that it would send new troops to Belgorod because of the security situation there. But this could be made up to calm the nerves of the people living there. And even if it has sent new people, we're probably talking about inexperienced conscripts. But when we cover the story of Ukrainian incursions, one thing doesn't make sense. And that is the rapidly deteriorating situation on the Eastern Front, particularly near the Donbas. Russia is closing in on the key city of Pokrovsk, which has been evacuated recently due to the growing Russian threat. It sits right next to another town called Mimohrad, and combined, the two had a pre-war population of more than 100,000 people. Although it's incredibly tragic, these people losing their homes is not even the biggest problem. Pokrovsk is a key town for Ukrainian logistics, as it hosts an important railway station and sits at the cross-section of major roads. If Russia takes this over, Ukrainian troops all over the Donbas front line will lose their supply and reinforcement lines. One military expert named Mikhailo Zorokov said that, if we lose Pokrovsk, the entire front line will crumble. We're talking about hundreds if not thousands of square miles potentially falling into the hands of Russians if Pokrovsk falls. The Russians are currently throwing everything that can move into the assault on Pokrovsk, according to the Ukraine's chief of armed forces. President Zelensky said he expected Russia to throw 50 to 60,000 people there and employ similar meat grinder tactics as it did in Bakhmat and Avdivka. Ukrainian forces are saying that the Russians are sending wave after wave of infantry, which are incredibly costly for them, but effective in the end. The Ukrainian forces were quickly outnumbered and exhausted. The effects of this showed. Russia has captured more than two dozen towns near Pokrovsk in the span of a few weeks. It advanced along the axis of the Avdivka attack that began all the way back in February. But for some of its gains, it didn't need to sacrifice much. The strongholds of New York and Novrohodivka were given up without much of a fight. By the way, I looked up why this town in Ukraine's Donetsk region is named after this American city. Apparently, it's because the wife of one of its 19th century founders was born there. Anyways, one Ukrainian politician claimed that the trenches near Novrohodivka, which used to hold about 20,000 men, were left mostly empty. This city had a pre-war population three times the size of the captured town of Sudza and Kursk, so this is not peanuts. Some say that Ukrainian forces are just giving up on this sector of the front because they're so heavily outmanned and outgunned. They see this as a huge miscalculation on Ukraine's part. After all, if it had spared the thousands of troops from the operations in Kursk and Belgorod, it could have had better defenses in the Donbas. The brigades involved in the attack were highly skilled and well-equipped, so they could have provided a ton of help. Besides, the Ukrainians thought that Russia would be so shocked by the Kursk incursion that it would halt the offensive in the Donbas. The Ukrainian general Sirsky said that one of the objectives of the offensive operation in the Kursk direction was to divert significant enemy forces from other directions, primarily from the Pokrovsk and Kurakov directions. There's been some reshuffling. Sirsky claimed that some 30,000 Russian troops were diverted to Kursk and that this number was on the rise. Also, Zelensky said the Pokrovsk offensive was slowing down, but military analysts generally agree that Russia's putting more pressure on Pokrovsk than Ukraine expected. Putin seems to think that defending Russia is a second priority. As he went all in on the Pokrovsk offensive, he left the Kursk station mostly in the hands of conscripts and kept the experienced fighting force on the offensive. Media outlets are reporting that Ukraine's losses in the east are outweighing its gains in Kursk. Indeed, if Pokrovsk gets taken, Zelensky and his military advisors have some explaining to do.
One Ukrainian citizen from Pokrovsk has said that the presence of Ukrainian troops in Kursk feels like treason. One meme circulated online recently in Ukraine, saying, So what with the Kursk region? We're running out of Donetsk. But it's not clear whether the Ukrainian leadership has made a serious miscalculation or if they made a strategic decision. To understand this, we have to look at the end game. We can only speculate as to what Zelensky and his military advisors were thinking when they drafted their plans. But we know for a fact that Ukraine's senior leadership is looking to end this war with a peace deal. Zelensky himself has said that the Kursk incursion is one of the stages to end the war. Back in June, there was a summit on peace in Ukraine and Switzerland, attended by 90 countries, leaving out only Russia. There, Zelensky was openly discussing a groundwork for a just and lasting settlement with Russia. The Ukrainian president wants a second summit in November, and he has said that Russia should attend. If this happens, it would be a groundbreaking event, as it's one of the first times Russia and Ukraine talk together. Also, it comes right after the US election, which isn't an accident. Donald Trump has said he wants to end the war as soon as possible, and there's a chance he becomes the US president. As the main backer of Ukraine, Washington has a big say in deciding when and how the conflict stops. The best scenario for Ukraine is that the war stops within the coming months, and that it can trade some Russian-held territories in Ukraine for parts of Kursk and perhaps Belgorod. This is not a theory anymore. The president of Ukraine stated that the Kursk offensive was related to the peace summit of November. He wants to use these territories as a bargaining tool. He probably won't get all of eastern Ukraine back in negotiations, but maybe Zelensky will take the deal. In any peace negotiations, both parties would have to meet in the middle. Russia wants to fully take control over four regions in Ukraine, namely Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia. The question is whether Putin still has these terms. There's a ton of pressure on Putin to end the disaster in Kursk and to a lesser extent in Belgorod. But if the Donbas front collapses, Putin might not be in for a peace agreement. Maybe he thinks that he can get better results if he doubles down on his offensive.